I mean, I understand when people say, well, we can't really go, do a no-fly zone uh, because of the possible response. On the other hand, reacting to what Putin says that, oh, he said we can't do it, we won't do it, is a big difference between not doing a no-fly zone or saying, oh, oh, we, he said we can't. We cannot go into an independent country that we consider a friend and we will listen to the Russians who are invading that country. That is an absurd, ridiculous response. Hi, I'm Emily Tampkin, and you're listening to World Review from the New Statesman, a twice-weekly international news podcast. I'm speaking with Tomas Hendrik Ilbis. He wears many hats, one of which is the former president of Estonia. Thank you so much for being with me today. Happy to be here, Emily. There's obviously a lot to talk about regarding um, Russia's horrible war in Ukraine. I, I sort of wanted to start, you know, for years that you, one has heard from Eastern Europeans, Northeastern Europeans, Central Eastern Europeans, the sense that those from from so-called Western Europe sort of didn't didn't take security concerns seriously enough, um, perhaps had some kind of dissension to Russia's more immediate neighbors about the threat posed by Russia. Um, if you agree with that assessment, if, if you if you think that so-called Western Europe did not take seriously enough the concerns by Russia's neighbors, do you think that this has marked a turning point? Well, time will tell. I mean, we're, we may just be dealing with uh, the immediate reaction when the previous positions of countries such as Germany and France became simply untenable ethically and morally, having basically dismissed and poo-pooed Central and Eastern Europeans for years made light of the concerns of those who actually had empirical evidence as opposed to wishful thinking and uh, you know blissful recollections of listening to Tchaikovsky and reading Dostoevsky and whose ideas and understanding of uh, Russia were formed by that, and as I said, primarily by wishful thinking. Whereas the countries that actually experienced this had experienced these things in the past, and also, which is important to note, were treated very differently by Russia, uh, as opposed to the rather psychophantic sucking up that you saw toward Germany and other countries, so that there was a, there was a difference in experience as well, but clearly it was uh, these countries were not listened to. What have you made of Europe and America's response to the war thus far? Well, I guess the most dramatic uh, three days after the beginning of the war on the 24th of February was the so is the so-called Zeitwende mm -hmm. of the Germans uh, with uh, Olaf Scholz's uh, rather dramatic speech uh, before the Bundestag on a Sunday, no less. It's already sort of Peter, it seems to be petering out or at least being attenuated. Uh, a lot of sort of walking back. Well, you know, but, but when it comes to energy, we really can't do anything because it would affect the economy so much. And so, uh, as I said, well, we're now 23 days into the war, the fourth, in, entering the fourth week. Uh, if anything, we see that the Russians having failed so miserably or perhaps only run out of precision weapons are resorting to uh, mass destruction, uh, indiscriminate killing, both at the individual level of simply targeting civilians and shooting them. I just saw a horrible video of 10 civilians that had been shot. I've seen videos of tanks just targeting a man walking and blowing him up. Uh, and then, of course, the mass bombing and that we saw in uh, Mariupol with the uh, with the shelter that was marked children that was purposefully bombed. This is a war of uh, extermination today. And I certainly would think that uh, countries like Germany might be a little more uh, sensitive to wars of extermination how long it will last, I don't know. Uh, I do hope that it does last because it's clear that there are those who are itching to get back who at the first sign of a any kind of change will say, okay, now let's so, okay, now let's dispense with the sanctions. You know, I mean, this is not the case. Um, 
And so we shall see. What is notable has been the, the, um, the role of the United States and President Biden, uh, which is uh, a welcome side. I mean, I think one of the reasons why we ended up where we are is that uh, Putin misread Biden with the Afghanistan withdrawal, as well as just the fact that he was uh, he's a nice guy. So you think, OK, for 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 a thug like Putin, being a nice guy means he's weak. I can exploit him. And this this was the wrong way to go, actually. On the other hand, what has I, I have found has really annoyed me no end is allowing the Russians to set the agenda. I mean, I understand when people say, well, we can't really go do a no-fly zone uh, because of the possible response. On the other hand, reacting to what Putin says that, oh, he said we can't do it, we won't do it, is a big difference between not doing a no-fly zone or saying, oh, oh, we, he said we can't. We cannot go into an independent country that we consider a friend and we will listen to the Russians who are invading that country. That is an absurd, ridiculous response. Those are things you don't talk about. Okay, don't do a no-fly zone if you're seriously concerned about the potential for conflict. Acquiescing to Russian demands on a third country basically says you have a droit de regard. Uh, you are tacitly giving the Russians a zone or sphere of influence on the, on the, in the tactical space. No, I mean, that is really dumb. And I mean, the whole thing was repeated with these saga with the, with the jets. Right. Again, I mean, why do you talk about it? I mean, you do what you do or you don't do what you don't do. But I mean, whatever it is that you do, you do not make public statements saying that we can't do this because this might offend the Russians. You are, I mean, they, I don't understand. Do people, have they, do they understand dealing with Putin, what it's about? No, they don't clearly, which is, you know, for all the firepower of the United States and other allies, um, it'd be a little sort of sensible, more sensible response uh, in articulating the response would be very much in order. For as much as the Russians and specifically Putin have been able to set the agenda, it also, I mean, they clearly misread Ukraine and Ukrainians. Why do you think, and, and you know, I don't, I, sort, I don't mean to romanticize anything about this war, including the Ukrainian response, but it is, it was clearly, it has clearly been more robust than, than Russia thought it would be. Why do you think they got this as wrong as they did? There are, there are a number of factors. First of all, there's the, the inherent racism of Russians towards Ukrainians. They're kind of country bumpkins and they're slow and dumb and we'll just go in there and they'll all run away. That's, that's like the starting point. And that's been a part of, you know, Mala Russia. Little Russia has been, a, has been a trope, as you well know, in Russia for centuries. So that's mm -hmm. already the starting point. Secondly, the sort of the jingoistic braggadocio of the current sort of of the current regime uh, is even goes even beyond that. I mean, you see that not only with respect to Ukraine, but you know the I mean the uh, the various uh, news shows. Oh, we'll just go drive to the Atlantic. We're gonna now finally take over. I mean, this kind of like chess beating bizarreness the third thing is corruption i mean we read that mr i mean whatever his rank is general bedeza beseda rather uh who is uh, who ran the fifth service of the fsb which is this bizarre service the fsb is not supposed to operate outside the territory of the russian federation but this one does and their task for the past several years has been to plant the seeds of uh, disruption and sabotage and uh, overall sort of uh, sowing uh, the field to be ripe for uh, local uprisings. And well, it turns out, and they spent a lot of money, $5 billion on this, except none of it got there. So I assume knowing the Russian way of doing things, I mean, uh, Beseda is going, yes, we've got to, I mean, we've been spending money on this. We're, we're all ready to go. The people will rise up. And then it turns out that, well, no, they didn't 
devote the last several years and five billion dollars to to create a fifth column and to do all of that. Instead, it turns out that uh, the combination of all of that, no money and their own sort of braggadocio and their overall dismissal of Ukrainians uh, as created a situation and so they didn't know what was happening. They didn't read the street, as it were. Right. They didn't I mean, read the country. There was one report that they had expected somewhere between 30 and 50% of Ukrainians to defect to Russia, which is just like clearly just such a wild, like, even if you think that some percentage is going to, it's not going to be half of the army. Well, again, this is, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, advice given to drug dealers, like mm -hmm. don't use your own stuff. Don't use the stuff you're selling. And this is clearly what happened. This re rhetoric about Russian speakers. I mean, they do, do not understand that in any of these countries, I mean, not just Ukraine, but just as much Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. A Russian speaker does not make you into a, a supporter of Russia. I mean, if and if people don't understand that, then think of how many English speakers in Ireland will rise up to demand to join the United Kingdom, right? Right. I mean, they don't do that. Your linguistic, your your first language, or your primary language is rarely a, rarely an indicator of your political allegiance. So there have been some who have said, uh, who have sort of warned that 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 they will next go into um, that, that that Russia, if not stopped here, or even if stopped here, um, will go into the Baltic states. We had one of your successors on the podcast, uh, President Karis, on the podcast um, last week, who basically said. No, nope, we're in NATO, not worried about it. Do you share that assessment? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, there are two aspects to this. I mean, two separate aspects. One is that, I mean, people have to understand NATO. I mean, even in my own country, they don't quite get it. It's like, yeah, we're a small country, but, you know, let's think back to West Berlin, right? I mean, <laughs> West Berlin could have been basically swallowed up in... 45 minutes. But you don't do that because Article 5 means a doing anything to any of these places, be it West Berlin, Estonia, or the United States. It That will trigger Article 5 and Omsk, Tomsk, and as Nabokov said, Atomsk will all be at risk at that moment. From the Russian side, you don't think about, oh, we'll just take it. Because as soon as you're in NATO, it's like, if we take it, we will have all of NATO to deal with. And that's really the main thing. On now the other side of this, it really is time to get rid of the NATO-Russia Founding Act from 1997, so 25 years ago, which uh, which we have all, which NATO has abided by, which says that no permanent stationing of troops or materiel uh, in countries that have joined since 1999. Now, what does that mean? I mean, basically, that means we have troop rotations of a small number of troops in all of these countries from other NATO allies. No real uh, forward prepositioning of uh, military equipment. So that, I mean, so we're basically, we are voluntarily tying our one hand behind our back while the Russians have so blatantly been violating this. So it's time to just trash bin throw out and declare null and void the NATO-Russia Founding Act because it means nothing if only one side abides by it and the other one is committing genocide. One of the incredible things, to my mind, is that is that Ukraine is able to, has been able, you know, so far to, to remain online, which means that it's been able to counter Russian disinformation, which means that uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky has been able to, to let his people know that he's still there, has been able to uh, connect with other world leaders. Um, that Ukrainians have been able to get information out. You, President, during the first major DDoS attack on another country by believed to be by, by Russia, what combination of factors do you think has, been, has has allowed Ukraine to remain as resilient in this one space as it has? Well, the first one is the utter failure of the Russian communication system, which has led them to ha use mobile phones, use the Ukrainian <laughs> mobile phone network. <laughs> which is one reason why all these major generals are finding their end fairly quickly, because you can spot them, right? I mean, 
same principle as your uh, your Google Maps when you're driving. It's like it knows where you are because you are geolocated by your phone. And so then you know who to shoot. But the problem is if you're reliant on the same network as the Ukrainians, well, you can't shut it down because your own system was such an utter failure. I mean, that's why they're using, they're not using a military network, whereas the other, I mean, other armies have their own network, so they're not reliant on that, on those systems. Uh, secondly, uh, I, through our efforts and other efforts, Ukraine has become quite resilient. Uh, I mean, you, there are things you can do to, uh, to uh, ameliorate the possible effects of a DDoS attack. Uh, we do know that the Russians have done some, already in 2015, they shut down uh, big swaths of uh, the electrical grid in Ukraine. Uh, we, in fact, went, were the first responders on that one. We immediately flew down when that happened. But the problem is that, well, you know, you also, I mean, the Russians also require the electrical grid. So... I mean, this is, you need the same infrastructure. Uh, so I suspect that is the major reason why they're not, they, we have not seen big, uh, big cyber uh, effort on their part at this point. On this sort of international criminal court, human rights law level, what do you think is appropriate and necessary moving forward? As with uh, Nuremberg, you need you 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 on the one hand need to uh, put uh, bring to justice the people responsible. So Putin, Shoigu, uh, Bastrykhin, Norishkin, Patrushev, Lavrov. I mean all of the people, but then all of the people below that too who actually implemented these policies, and then of course at the level of the um, perpetrators. I mean, we know every, the name of just about every soldier that is in there, because that's been hacked. We know who's there. And I mean, it can take years of investigation. Who was the person who ordered shooting 10 civilians in a, in a bread line uh, two days ago, uh, you know, February 16th, shot in you know, Mariupol by Russian soldiers who was there. I mean, that's all you, you can figure all that out. Now, one of the things that I do find funny is this kind of uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't. I mean, now I see this uh, bleating and whining about, why did Biden say war criminal about Putin? Why is he personalizing him? And then you have these other people or the same people say, it's not the Russian people, it's Putin. Well, frankly, it's both. I mean, uh, Putin is not uh, is not uh, the one shooting or uh, dropping the bomb on the on the shelter with the kids in it. I mean, he's the overall responsible for it. On the other hand, the individual war crimes are committed by individuals. We have to deal with both. I mean, I don't know. I'm getting kind of tired of this. Well, the Russian people are not to blame for this. Well, yeah, the Russian people as an abstract entity are not to blame for this. On the other hand, 71% support, nah, well, maybe you're not like going to be liked very much. This does not mean that all people have, you know, you don't have Zippenhaft, which you have in Germany. Collective guilt, no, but on the other hand, you're not going to change the attitude of people toward Russian, for Russians for, for decades and decades. I mean, Nina Khrushchev, the great-granddaughter of Nikita Khrushchev, just wrote a piece saying, this is going to be a stain for a century. Mm -hmm. on Russians, and that's going to be a big problem. But if you don't really do anything about it, um, well, that's inevitable. This has been so much written on this, so much coverage of this. What do you think we are still missing in the way in which we, including in this own com in, in our own conversation today, um, missing in our, in our discussion of Russia's war in Ukraine? Well, better weaponry. I mean, that's one sort of as basic as it gets. I mean, yeah, I mean, giving like a thousand or eight thousand uh, stingers is great, but stingers don't reach fixed wing air uh, airplanes that are doing bombing from way up. You need 
We need and aircraft missiles. Well, send them that. I mean, that's like just arming Ukrainians better. More creative thinking, less talk. I mean, sort of entire discussions about do we or do we not allow the Poles to give these MiGs? You know, there is um, the ludicrousness of this is actually exemplified in a movie from called The Darkest in the Darkest Hour, where Winston Churchill, played by whoever brilliantly played it, is on the phone. The other is FDR. And, uh, you know, the Brits had bought like 250 Spitfires and paid for them. But FDR wouldn't send them to, to the Brits because they were, they were uh, passed the law and then uh, about arming sides. And so, and, and this is the height of the Battle of Britain. Britain's going to lose. Churchill's like, please, can you just take them over the border to Canada and we'll do the rest. And then FDR says, well, I'll tell you what, we'll, we can bring them to a mile of the Canadian border and you bring horses over and drag them across. But this is what we're, this is the level at which we are. You know, I mean, we cannot, we like, we have these big discussions and we end up saying, no, we're not going to allow them to have these MiGs. Just leave them by the border. I mean, and don't say anything. Shut the up. You know what I mean? I mean? Just you can do things. I mean, be creative. On right? that call, on that call for less discussion, I will end our discussion. Um, thank you so much for taking the time today. <laughs>